So just to give you a quick tour of Jewish art <laughs> in 20 minutes, right? Uh, we've done all the music, we resolve that. Um, uh, and I've got a hard stop at nine because I've got another meeting to run to. Um, we're gonna take a look at some examples of Jewish art. And you might think that there isn't a lot of Jewish art historically because people often assume that the 10 commandments meant you couldn't make Jewish art. So in the 10 commandments, um, it says very clearly in verse four, you shall not make yourself an idol or an image of anything that is in the heavens above or in the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You will not bow down to them, nor will you serve them. Um, and he will punish you to multiple generations if you commit the sin. So understanding was that Jews just didn't make visual art, right? No statues, no paintings, no depictions of human form. But we know that today Jews make art. There are Jewish artists. There's even a Jewish art institute in Israel called the Betzalel Institute. Um, and the name Betzalel actually comes from this same Hebrew Bible because Betzalel is the artist who's commanded in the book of Exodus to build the tabernacle that holds the Ten Commandments. And the description of the tabernacle includes all kinds of figurative art of the angels. Uh, now, we do find other passages that are very explicit that you do not see any image of God. Um, so in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15, uh, even though God came down and gave you the Ten Commandments and had all these wonderful miracles he did for you in verse 15, be very careful, for you saw no kind of form on the day he spoke to you out of the middle of the fire, lest you corrupt yourself and make yourself a carved image in the form of any figure, likeness of male or female, likeness of any animal on the earth, of any winged bird in the sky, of anything that creeps on the ground, any fish in the water. No images, no statues. Well, you think that sounds like a pretty, you know, complete pro proscription of all of those. However, um, we know now, as I said, that there are examples of Jewish art, um, but notice that these aren't necessarily images of animals, okay? Uh, so you can imagine that maybe there's a distinction between figurative art of human figures or animal figures versus imagery, right? You could do plants, you could do geometric figures. Think of Islamic art. In many versions of Islam, they prescribed making human forms or animal forms um, Shiite art would allow it. Persian art does have it, but um, Sunni art generally doesn't. But they do allow calligraphy, beautiful writing. They allow beautiful geometric patterns and plants. So if you go into a beautiful mosque like the Mosque of Omar in Jerusalem, if you can make your way in, um, you'll see it's beautifully decorated, but it's not decorated with any animals or any people. It's the geometrics and the plants and calligraphy. That's what you were allowed to do. There was also a period in the, uh, in the uh, Byzantine uh, Eastern Orthodox Church Called the anti uh, the iconoclastic period where they wiped out all the um, mosaics and only some rare monasteries out in the hinterlands have saved them but they, they also took that very strict proscription approach to uh, images but there was always a, the option of doing some kind of artistic creation so here's an example of apples and honey plates that a particular judaic art uh, store will uh, sell you or you can look at their selection of Hanukkah menorahs or artistic candles or collectible dreidels that are beautifully designed. Um, you can look at um, their Passover selection that will have Seder mm -hmm. plates and Afikoman covers and Elijah's cups and uh, Haggadahs and there's a whole tradition of illuminated Haggadahs. So clearly the idea of having Jewish items that were beautiful was allowed. You were supposed to decorate the Torah with crowns and a breastplate and a cover and you had a curtain to cover the ark. You could have carvings in the synagogue. You could have a beautiful kiddush cup. So there's all kinds of art pieces that are art for art's sake. They're art for fulfilling the mitzvah, this concept of kidur ha-mitzvah or embellishing the commandment by doing it in a beautiful way. So having, you could have, you know, plain brass candlesticks or you could have beautiful candlesticks that would give you more joy in celebrating. So I mentioned this Ark of the Covenant is described in the Hebrew Bible and you actually know what the Ark of the Covenant looks like if you've seen Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. That beautiful gold top with the angels with their wings covering them, that's exactly how it's described in the Hebrew Bible. So they're making images of angels with wings, and I mean, they're clearly carving things. And there are plenty of other examples as well. There's even one passage in Exodus chapter 24 where Moses and the elders go up to visit Yahweh. They get up early in the morning, they travel up the hill, and in verse 10, they saw the God of Israel. 
Under his feet was a paved work of sapphire. So they saw him and they saw his feet. They saw him and they ate and drank. Because of course you have to have a nosh if you're going to visit. <laughs> but notice they see his feet here in accident. What, what's going on? In Deuteronomy it said they didn't see anything. Well, how do we make sense of this? Uh, it even gets worse, by the way. If you read other chapters, you'll notice there's a passage where um, Moses uh, is dealing with a plague and um, has to save the Hebrew people. And he does so by um, uh, getting the venomous snakes to leave. Yahweh says to him, make a venomous snake, set it on a pole. And so Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. If any serpent bit the man, you looked at the serpent of bronze. He Moses is making a statue of a bronze serpent? What? <laughs> how, how do we make sense of this? And finally, if you go further into history, you'll see that the, um, uh, the temple in Jerusalem had many statues as well. The vessels for Baal and for the Asherah, these holy pillars and all sorts of things that needed to get taken out and burned to clean out the temple, but they were used in the temple for so many centuries. So how do we make sense of this tradition? Well, the reality is that um, it could be just different traditions, that one tradition that it was okay to see a God, says Moses saw God face to face at one point, other traditions later on said, no, you couldn't see a God, and they had to go backdate and re-edit or put a new uh, end to the story. Um, and the same thing for making images. Maybe one tradition was iconoclastic and one was okay with making a bronze serpent or uh, images of angels. Um, or maybe they were hypocrites. <laughs> Who knows? You know? At some point, somebody broke Moses' staff. Right. In, uh, under Hezekiah's yeah. kingship, they take the staff out and get rid of it because it's, it's gone corrupted or whatever. Or maybe, maybe there's a, um, you're not allowed to make unauthorized figurative art. That is, if God commands you to make this, then you could do that. But if he didn't command you to make a fertility goddess statue, or he didn't command you to make a golden bull or a calf, which happens in the Exodus story, but also happens as the kingdom split between north and south, well, then it's unauthorized figurative art. That's what's banned, not necessarily all figurative art. Um, or they might even make a distinction between making animal images or angel images versus God images. That is, maybe you can get away with making a bull in a certain time period, but it's not the God. It's what the God stands on or sits on. So, and the, the throne is the image of the, where the God is, but not the God itself. And remember also, there's a stricter prohibition on making images of people. Why? Remember how people are created in Genesis? They're made in the image of God. So if you make a human image, it's like you've made an image of God, and that is trait. That's beyond the pale. Okay, so the assumption was by uh, many Jews themselves, but also scholars for many centuries, was that by the time the rabbis took over Judaism, this anti-imagery trend was very well rooted in Jewish life, and they simply weren't making any artistic images at all. But then archaeology came in to sort of mess things up. Yeah. Because archaeology is, you know, uh, persistent in the way that it actually preserves what people actually did. Okay, so here are a set of images that were part of a synagogue in Tura Europa, uh, which is made around the year 250 of the Common Era. It's unfortunately in Syria, so it may or may not still be there, and it may or may not, you know, uh, survive. But we have images of what was there. Um, and you'll notice, I mean, the scale of this is very large. Um, this is a miniature version that's uh, at the uh, museum in uh, Tel Aviv. Um, but they also include numerous scenes from the Bible, and we'll see some of the details. So this is an example of uh, a king being carried. You'll notice it might be from the, oh, this is David, the king of Israel. Um, so he's being carried by his people. And again, you see people there, although you can't necessarily see faces. We're not sure if that's in this at this moment. Uh, from uh, wear and tear, or if they didn't draw the faces, but we'll see actually, oh, yes, they were happy to draw faces. Here's an image of Joshua. And notice how he's dressed, like somebody living in 250 of the Common Era in the Greco-Roman world, right? He's dressed in contemporary garb, because again, just like music, it's going to draw on the vocabulary, the visual vocabulary of, uh, of art of the time period. Um, here's a picture of the Jews crossing the Red Sea. And notice some interesting details here. First of all, you see Pharaoh's chariots drowning. You have Moses, you know, lifting his staff and then lowering his staff. You see the armies chasing and the fish on either side when the waters are parted. 
What do you see at the top here? Hands. Looks like hands. hands. Whose? Arms. Looks like God's hands. Right. Exactly. What? <laughs> not just people, not just faces. Divine hands? There's a number of places where I stretch out my hand. Yeah, oh, he frees them with a, a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Yeah, yeah. It's totally part of biblical vocabulary, but you wouldn't have expected it in a synagogue in 250. These guys are dressed like Right. Now notice this one. Here is Moses being found in the river by Pharaoh's daughter, right? And then being taken by Miriam to be nursed by his own mother. That's part of the story. But what do you notice about Pharaoh's daughter? She is not wearing nothing. That's right, because she's bathing in the water. In a synagogue? <laughs> they put a naked woman? What? And also notice, by the way, well, but notice that the um, even the, the sort of uh, woman with the baby has sort of that Madonna and child kind of you know imagery to it that you might have seen in Christian iconography. Um, and you also notice that the Egyptians and the Hebrews don't seem to dress that differently. Right? Her attendants are not dressed that differently from uh, what, what else uh, you see. But again, you'd be shocked to find a naked woman in a synagogue these days, given all the modesty rules they have. This is the story of Elijah uh, burning the altar that was soaked with fire versus the priests of Baal, who were unable to cause Baal to make the fire light. It's the famous scene um, of the, proving the power of Yahweh under Elijah. Here's a picture of this sacrifice of Isaac where you have uh, Abraham going, you have the uh, wood on the altar, um, you have the ram stuck with his horns in the bush, um, and you also have Abraham with the knife, and again, a little hand coming out of the sky saying stop, which is part of the story. And then here's a depiction of the arch in the synagogue. This would have been where the Torahs were kept, I think. Um, and you'll notice some of the imagery here. You have the binding of Isaac, again, in the upper right that we saw the detail of. You have a depiction of the seven candled menorah that was in Jerusalem, uh, again, for the seven days of the week. And that was what was lit by the Maccabees and so on. And then you have the entrance to the temple itself with um, the, uh, the pillars here and uh, certain decorations and so on. So this was a synagogue, by the way, being built, you know, centuries after the temple was destroyed. But they're remembering the temple and what was there, and that, that's part of the iconography for the, uh, the synagogue and its ideal uh, framing. So there you have one version of uh, a synagogue with shocking information. Guess what? Here's another one from several centuries later. This is from uh, Beit Alpha, which is in the sixth century, uh, found in the land of Israel proper, and these are mosaic floors. So rather than painted walls where you have in Europa, it's unusual to have walls survive because walls tend to fall down. But floors can make it. And the mosaic floors in, on a number of these synagogues are really uh, astounding, um, not just for the beauty of the art, uh, but also for the content. So here we have an inscription saying, thank you for paying for this. Uh, you know, again, what, what else is new, right? Uh, you still had benefactors that helped pay for the, the renovation. Here we have, again, a binding of Isaac depiction. Um, and notice they're, they're labeled. This is Avraham. This is Yitzchak. So they actually put names on the characters so you know what's going on. Here you have the ram stuck. Here are the two servant boys that come with the donkeys with them. And again, here you have the voice from above with even a hand coming out of the sky that's getting Abraham to stop from sacrificing his son. Now, why would they focus on the Binding of Isaac story? Remember that that's also thought to be where the Temple Mount in Jerusalem was. That's that's where God will cause his name to dwell. Um, and so that's why it was in next to the imagery of the temple in that previous synagogue. It's also a prominent place in this uh, decoration of this uh, synagogue, which again is several centuries after the temple's gone, but the idea of holy space, uh, even in a transplanted location is important. Now this is even more fascinating. It is the Zodiac, that's right. You have the different seasons uh, following even the, uh, the Greco-Roman pattern you see uh, Cancer with the crab, you see uh, Pisces for the fish, you have uh, Gemini for the twins, right? Amim is what it has there. Um, you have the ox, you have um, the scorpion right here, uh, you have the archer, right? Uh, all these are common zodiac symbols. They're even divided into seasons, right? You've got three in each season. 
making up a 12 month calendar and you've got the goddess of each season here and who do you have in the middle helios the sun god with his chariot mm -hmm. <laughs> well <laughs> isn't that fascinating what is this zodiac doing in a synagogue well obviously this was part of what was acceptable belief in that time period and there are times where the rabbis say you know you shouldn't rely on fortune tellers but this rabbi went to a fortune teller and he told the truth and so this was part of the ferment of the area you know people were not uh the jewish people did not come from the temple in jerusalem to maimonide and philosophy like you know it takes an evolution of ideas and so clearly at this time period in the sixth century zodiac was totally acceptable for decoration in a synagogue it was their part of their way of marking time um, here again you have depictions of the temple in Jerusalem with the seven candle menorahs again you'll see and this lion is a common symbol because the lion was a symbol for Judah or the Judeans. So fast forwarding now several centuries um, Jews continued to decorate their synagogues with art um, but sometimes it was in a different vein so here's a picture of a recreation of a, a wooden synagogue that would have stood in Poland um, I believe in the 19th century. Now, this is actually part of the Jewish Museum in uh, Warsaw. Um, so it's, you know, been recreated. Most of those, unfortunately, those wooden synagogues were destroyed during pogroms and the Holocaust. Um, but if you notice the, the beautiful detail here, and again, you don't have human figures, but you have animal figures, and you have iconography like the Ten Commandments. Um, you have beautiful geometric shapes, plant shapes, and so on. Um, and of course, calligraphy with the Hebrew letters. And you'll notice also the beautifully decorated forest stand, you know, beam up platform that they would have used to read and how they work in so many beautiful vibrant colors and all that is part of the, um, the beauty, uh, beautification of the ritual practice. Yeah. Uh, this is painted and I believe they were wooden synagogues. So they were painted. They weren't, they weren't doing mosaics in this period. Oh. Yeah, it, it, it does look a, um, a little mosaic, but I, I'm almost positive it's painted. Rhonda, were you going to add something? Yeah. I don't know how this would show on if I just held up my phone, but I have Judaica mosaics that I created. Uh, I don't know. Which one of them? Yeah, that's nice. And uh, what else do I want to show you? And the, the Hamsa, the uh, picture of the hand with an eye in it is, a, again, a Jewish iconography piece that gets taken from other mystical traditions as well. Right. And there's another, yeah. another one. Yeah. I didn't think of that before. <laughs> What? No. Oh, they, they just uh, happened to get one of those as a gift from somebody. So, uh, yeah, for Christmas. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the evil eye can get anybody. Um, now, there's also a tradition not just of bringing Jewish art to bear in synagogue settings, um, but also in ritual objects. So there's a wonderful tradition of medieval Haggadot or uh, Passover books, uh, ceremonial books. Um, this is one called the Sarajevo Haggadah, which is famous because it was uh, uh, created in the Balkans, part of the Sephardic Jewish tradition, but it was saved during the Bosnian War by a Muslim museum curator who knew how important it was. And there's a whole story about the saving of this Haggadah. But you'll notice in these pages, oh, you have wonderful depictions of biblical scenes. So here we have uh, Moses blessing the people, uh, Moses transmitting his power to Aaron at the end, of the interest of the promised land. Again, you have that Jerusalem depiction there. But if you go to earlier pages, you'll see here is um, uh, uh, Noah on the ark, and then Noah emerging from the ark. You have to read it like a comic book, but you have to read right to left, because it's church style. So you start upper right, you got Noah floating on the ark, sending out the birds, you've got Noah getting out, planting a vineyard, and you have Noah drunk, and one of the sons is making fun of him, the other two walk backwards to cover him with a cloth, um, then you have them building the Tower of Babel underneath. So it's the biblical narrative, but depicted visually as a, you know, almost a comic book form. Um, here we have, uh, during the Exodus, the uh, carrying out of Joseph's bones. Here's Moses again coming to Pharaoh. Notice how Pharaoh looks. He looks like a European king, right? 
uh, and the towns look very European too. Um, and here is Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. You can tell again by the iconography of the two tablets. Um, and here they are entering the land and harvesting. And so, so they're depicting sort of uh, common biblical scenes, uh, but really having no problem depicting human forms. Um, there's another medieval Haggadah we're not going to look at. It's called the um, a date is about the 13th century. Um, there's another. Absolutely, yeah. And, and they'll have they'll have pages with beautifully illuminated first words or first letters, just like you'll find in medieval European manuscripts. Um, there's another Haggadah from the same time period called the Bird's Head Haggadah, which has human forms, but they all have a bird's face instead. So in that particular place and time, they decided you can make human forms, but you can't make human faces. So they had to put bird's faces instead of people's faces from that interpretation of that prohibition on making images of God. Um, and then, you know, we enter the modern period and then you get sculptors who aren't even afraid of statues anymore and uh, modern Jewish artists. And uh, Mark Chagall is one of the more famous of them, right? Um, and some of his art is simply European art of his time period and uh, style. Um, you know, you look at Mark Rothko's art and, you know, it's very modern art, like, you know, two colors on a canvas and it untitled and you think, I could do this, you know, uh, it's not worth $10,000 or whatever. Um, but, uh, but you know, the fact that he's Jewish doesn't really make a difference. But if he if he talk, called it creation or he uh, did a series of stained glass windows for a synagogue, right, then, then it becomes something meaningful. And a lot of Chagall's work is... Right. Oh yeah, and there's also a wonderful set of uh, Chagall stained glass at the at the Chicago Institute uh, uh, Art Institute. Um, if you have a chance to go down there, um, and at uh, the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, also has a beautiful set of Chagall windows. He's certainly done art that is unambiguously Jewish and other stuff that may not be as as foreground, uh, foregrounded, uh, and obviously his dreamy style is there. Um, here's one that's clearly a Jewish piece, right? Yeah. It's called Jew in Black and White. <laughs> it's got an Orthodox Jew wearing the felon and the prayer shawl, and I, that's unambiguously Jewish art. But again, this isn't something that the Jew, that a Jew like that would have commissioned for himself, necessarily, but it's something that's representing him. And then of course, there's this sort of dreamscapes that he would paint, um, and this one is a famous one that is, I think, in the Art Institute of Chicago. It's called White Crucifixion. And what's fascinating about this piece is that you have um, clearly Jewish symbols. You've got a synagogue with the Ten Commandments and the Ark here being spoiled by a pogrom. Um, you've got uh, the sort of ghosts of the Jews lamenting and wailing up above. You've got Red Army coming in and uh, destroying homes in a pogrom. You've got people fleeing with Torah scrolls. Uh, you've got the uh, candelabras here. You've got a burning Torah scroll in the corner. And in the middle, what do you see? You see a crucifixion with Jesus. What's he wearing? A talus, a prayer shawl. You can tell by the fringe on the bottom, right? Right? So it's Jesus the Jew who's suffering just like Jews today are suffering. So it's an, a really an ideological argument here. Um, and uh, it's really a fascinating piece of its time, but also representing uh, Jewish dynamics. You notice the flags in the back, I think it's Romania back there, which was a, a, a prominent persecutor of Jews. Um, this one is 1938. So it's pre-Holocaust, but in times of Jewish persecution in Poland and in other places. And, the, and after Kristallnacht, right, that's the same time period, exactly. So, you know, the, the funny thing about Chagall though, is that here's an example of his sort of more dreamy style uh, painting, and he's actually the one who had the idea, and I don't have a, an image of it here, of uh, someone playing a violin on the roof. He didn't call it Fiddler on the Roof, and in the Sholem Aleichem stories there is no Fiddler on the Roof, <laughs> but it's the imagery of Chagall that was used by the writers of the musical and the set designers to inspire how they designed it. Um, so if you see pictures from the original production in 1964, the set was designed with Chagall imagery in mind, and the very concept of the fiddler on the roof is from the imagery of Chagall with this violinist playing on the roof. 
And uh, so it's uh, Chagall's version of Jewish art that has become sort of a template for all kinds of Jewish music and other kinds of Jewish cultural creativity. So that's a very quick tour through uh, Jewish music and Jewish art as uh, representations of nonverbal Jewish culture. Again, you know, this is the case where when we're talking about modern Jewish culture, there's going to be some pieces that are unambiguously Jewish and some pieces that could have a foot in two worlds and some pieces that are sort of tough to argue are Jewish, even if they have a Jewish composer or creator. Um, I mean, what's our story? Right. So if you decide that uh, West story is not Jewish, um, just because the content isn't Jewish, Jewish composer, okay. Um, it is interesting to know though, uh, you may not have known that when he originally was planning to write the uh, musical, he was planning it as Jews and Irish battling with each other in the Oh, that's interesting. No, I didn't know that. And um, he found that the musical contrast wasn't, wasn't strong enough, you know, uh, that it would actually be a better production if it were salsa Latin American music and jazz American you know, music. And that, that way he could have the musical contrast and the dance hall scene and other parts of the story. Uh, when it was the Jews and the Irish, it didn't, uh, it didn't play out musically as well. But that was his original model. Yeah, that's, that's funny. I would not have, I would have thought, well, where my dad grew up, it was the Italians and the Jews and the rest of it wasn't the Irish. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you may also remember, um, that, so Bernstein did that in the 60s. Right. Um, in the 70s, there was a TV show, I think I mentioned last time, called uh, uh, Bridget Loves Bernie, that was about an Irish family, an Irish bride and a Jewish groom that got married and, you know, and about their family dynamics and they had all kinds of stuff about interfaith marriage and the priest and the rabbi come over for dinner and all kinds of stuff like that. And the Jewish community lost its gourd over this. I mean, they, <laughs> they, 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 how dare you present this as a positive role model or anything good? And uh, so they had to take it off the air after about a season and a little bit. Uh, I'm actually curious to see if I can dig it up on uh, YouTube if somebody's I've heard, I recorded the name. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to. Um, but, uh, you know, I can imagine Bernstein also didn't want to get the hate mail of, you know, this love affair across boundaries and the bad people are the ones who are stopping the people who love each other across boundaries. But if well, it's, and that particular, I mean, that's, that's a time period where Jews are still pretty ghettoized, you know, in the United States. I mean, but they aspired to more. Yeah. Um, and by the 60s, it might have been a harder sell as Jews are moving into suburbia and they're welcome to Levittown and other places, you know, where whites are, where if they made it a non-white and, and white, even if it was off-white in Latin America, that would be palatable. Um, I mean, again, if it had been a black and white, think about the movie, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, yeah, exactly. Bonte, which was very controversial and came out years after yeah. West Side Story. Um, so America wasn't quite ready for that. Um, well, yeah. they freaked out over the interracial kiss between Kirk and Hura, you know. Yeah, uh, right, right. Star Trek. So. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> you know, the boundaries uh, help to define what we do. And uh, I mentioned the example of the jazz singer. Uh, you may remember the last scene in that movie is Al Jolson putting on blackface and singing Mammy. Yeah. <laughs> because having a real black person sing in a theater wouldn't work. But having a white person or a Jewish person put on blackface and pretend to be black and sing a stereotypically insulting song, that was high theater for Vaughn. So, uh, you know, cultures and standards change over time. So what's the, what is the origin of the klezmer music? I mean, it's, I mean, the instrumentation is, is European. European, right. It's, it's like 16th century, I don't know, uh, 1600s and forward. Um, and uh, more so starting in the uh, 19th century, because that's when you begin to have instru instruments like the clarinet and right. others that are invented that become right. part of it. Originally, it was just like a couple of violins that would go and travel, and they, they became actually known as uh, like wedding musicians mm -hmm. for Jewish and non Jewish weddings, too. They would come and play because they were itinerant. You know, the peasants are tied to the land, but Jews are not necessarily forced to live in one place so they can travel around and, and have these sort of troops that, uh, that travel. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think of troubadours in Western Europe, all they you know, they have is this more Eastern of, Europe then? I mean, it's more Eastern Europe, yeah. Um, and it, what's interesting is a classical music becomes really popular uh, in Eastern Europe, late 19th century, let's say, um, and then it has a decline um, in the 20s, 30s, 40s. People aren't listening to classical music very much because they're assimilating to America. They're, 
know, they've, they've left that behind. Obviously, the Holocaust wipes out the native setting for that music. Um, and there's a, it isn't until there's a Klezmer revival in the 1970s um, where there's interesting cross fertilization with jazz music. A lot of jazz musicians begin to look for their Jewish roots in the multicultural era, you know, where that becomes a new thing, where people are returning to their cultural roots. I mean, not just assimilating to America. Uh, for musicians, they wanted to find authentic Jewish music, and they found some of this old Klezmer stuff from the 10s, 20s, 30s, and began to play the records and learn the sheet music and then write original Klezmer, and that's part of that revival in the, the 70s and 80s. Now, I've heard the, it's, what's it called, Maxwell Street Klezmer music? Yeah. And they're very good. Yeah, yeah they're wonderful. They're, it, it's, oh, yeah. Great. All right, well, thanks very much uh, for those who came. <laughs> and those who are watching online, um, well, for you, yes. or in the future on YouTube. <laughs> um, so we will uh, be picking up our next time by looking at um, Jewish lifestyle and diet. How did Jews earn a living? What did they eat? What did they wear? Uh, you know, we spend so much time looking at Jewish culture as things they consume in a cultural setting, like art and music. But what about everyday life, you know, uh, ordinary material culture? Um, that often gets overlooked. Um, it's also, by the way, where you find a lot more women's experience historically, because women didn't have access to the, they couldn't be wandering troubadours, and they weren't writing Torah commentaries because it wasn't supported by the culture at the time. But making food, making clothing, choosing what to wear, dealing with issues of uh, family purity and so on, that was absolutely part of women's experience. So. Uh, this gives us a more complete picture of Jewish life by looking at that uh, less high culture and more ordinary person culture.